me just get adjusted here. Good evening, ladies. All right, let me look at my notes here. It says, uh, it says breathe. It says smile. It says hi. Hi, guys. All right, I think I'm ready. Well, I'm Salma Ali, for those who don't know. Actually, Salma Ali is my first name. Some people think it's my last name, but my last name is Rodriguez. That's my husband's last name. <laughs> uh, oh, my middle name is Hussein Abdullah. It actually means uh, the great servant of God. So I have a name to live up to, you know? I'm doing it. I'm doing it. But good evening, guys. I'm just so grateful to honestly, man, it was by God's timing uh, to be able to just share my heart because I'm just going to share what God has been teaching me. He's been exposing the deep waters of my heart. And I really do believe that whatever I'm learning, I'm pretty sure it may hit one of you guys. So, hey. But it's so funny because uh, a couple, I think like a couple of weeks ago, I was just walking, minding my own business, somewhere on campus, and then I hear just like someone running behind me, and I hear somebody say, hey, Psalms, hey, Psalms, my nickname, and it's Brianna Lester. Oh, she's always following me. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. But anyway, she comes behind me. I was like, I was like, hey, Brie. And then something, when you're around Brie, be careful, okay? You got to be careful because she, she can, like, barely know you, and she'll be asking the most intentional questions and the most randomest times. And I'm like, why are you asking this? Why? And then very randomly, she, she said, um, hey, Psalms, I'm just curious. Out of all the fruits of the Spirit, what do you struggle the most with? And I was like, that's a really good question. And I hesitated because automatically there was a, a word in my head. And I said, joy. I have a hard time when it comes to joy. And I felt embarrassed. I felt ashamed. Because I know that as a Christian, intellectually, I have every reason to be joyful. And then she asked why, and I couldn't answer. I was like, I don't know. But thankfully, we serve a God with all the answers in the Bible. <laughs> and so today, we're just going to do a good old study about being joyful. <laughs> but as I was studying out the word joy, I was like, man, this is, I think the concept of joy can be a little bit hard to explain. But I know everyone in this room can see joy. You know, you, you know when there's a joyful person. And I know in this room, you, there may be a moment of your life where you felt abundance of joy. But also, I know in this room, there have been moments where you felt all that joy just disappear. Right? It's something that we can all relate to, but something that I've realized that you can get things done in life, do your business, do your thing, but without joy, life feels so much heavier. It feels a lot more harder. Life feels like a burden when you don't have joy in your life. And I really believe as Christians, I think we've gotten better at putting on an appearance of joy than actually cultivating the real thing. <laughs> We can paint on cheerfulness, thinking it will get the job done, but it doesn't truly satisfy us, satisfies us, and the world can see right through it. And so my goal today, tonight, ladies, is that I hope that this lesson inspires you, but maybe one of you guys, you felt like your joy has been taken away, and I hope that tonight, your joy can be restored. And so my title today is The Joy of the Redeemed. And so please turn with me to Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35. All right, let me get there. Isaiah 35. And this is where I got my title because the title of Isaiah 35 is called The Joy of the Redeemed. 
And um, sometimes we can mistake in the word uh, happiness and joy. So happiness is actually the, the feeling. But when I looked up the word joy in Hebrew, it actually means to express God's goodness. So it's an action when we feel happy, right? And the word redeem means to get something back. And I know when, someone, when something is taken from me, I want it back right? And so my first point today is called the joy of salvation. So Isaiah 35, we're going to start in verse 3. Verse 3, and it says, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs, and the hot were Jackalites? <laughs> Jackalites. Jackals. Jackals. Thank you. I was like, what are those? Once lay grass and reeds and papyrus will grow and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor ravian beast. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. Then they, uh, they will enter Zion with singing and everlasting joy with crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and signing will flee away. I love this scripture. You know, when we read this scripture, it's incredible because it, it's being written at a time where there were many threats surrounding the people of God. Even the chapters uh, before it, it talks about the judgment on those nations. But to God's people, though judgment surrounded them, they would be able to be joyful because they would be redeemed. They would be able to be full of joy because they would be totally protected, totally safe from judgment. And that's because they would have salvations for their souls. And the scripture, it's amazing because the language that is being used is talking about the redemption we will have under Christ. And it's directly referring to the people that will follow the way, as it says in John uh, 14, verse 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so those who follow Jesus would possess this joy. They will be filled with singing, and the joy wouldn't be momentary, but it will be an everlasting crown of joy. It will be overtaken by singing, and crying and sadness will be no more. And honestly, I believe I picked this scripture because it really describes my life when I became a Christian. And I thought I'd just take this little opportunity to share my laugh. Um, but yeah, uh, I was actually born in San Francisco and, um, I grew up um, maybe till I was five years old and sadly, uh, my parents divorced because my, my father was unfaithful. Um, but also on top of that, just because of, he was actually Muslim and so my dad wanted to take on another wife and my mom want nothing to do with that. And so, um, they split and I moved down to Texas with my mama. And uh, it was a pretty decent childhood. I was an only child, so I don't know if you can tell. Sometimes I'm, I'm awkward and distance because I, I grew up as an only child. I talk to myself a lot. Um, but I think I would say I, I grew up by pretty, I had a fair childhood. My mom, she worked incredibly hard. But I know deep down I never felt fully happy. Um, my dad, he was very in and out of my life. And um, I've always desired that relationship with him. I always wanted to be daddy's little girl. And I never felt secure, confident, or protected. Um, and so I grew up and I got actually really close to one of my uncles and he was my dad in my life and I remember my senior year this is back in 2016 um, where out of nowhere he just passed away you know 
And religious wise, I my faith was very in and out. I felt like I was living two different worlds. I I, uh, I don't know if you guys know Hannah Montana. Um, <laughs> But she lived two different worlds because uh, I could relate to that. Because when I when I was in uh, San Francisco, um, I would be on my dad's side, who were Muslim, and then when my mom said the family, they're they're Mexican, and be on my Catholic side. Um, but I never found any sort of security or identity, and I couldn't be joyful. And so when I had my uncle. I never felt so happy, so secure. Um, so I felt like he, he saw right through me. And when he was taken away, I couldn't understand. And because I didn't have any faith at the time or, and I was questioning God, it was a very confusing time. I had no idea how to really cope with my emotions. Um, and so I was actually gonna go down to Texas for an engineering program. I got accepted, all that good stuff. But it was so much heartache, I couldn't take it. So I actually decided to drop out uh, from the university down there and I just decided to just move up to San Francisco to my dad's side of the family. And I thought I was like, okay, I'm gonna go just run away and start a new life, but I was still hurting. And over time, my heart uh, started getting harder and number right? And uh, I thought that everything was going to be okay, but when I came to my dad's side of the family, it was very challenging. Um, in the household, there was a lot of physical and uh, verbal abuse, and I was the oldest cousin in the family. Now, when it comes to the, the Arab uh, or the Middle Eastern family, everyone lives together. So in the household, you have like, I have my grandparents, my two aunts, my two uncles, and my six cousins. And so we're all all together it was always crazy but not not in a good way not in a good way and so but then my dad entered my life and I was trying to get to know him but in the Middle Eastern uh, culture it's not it's like if you if you're my blood then there's nothing more that I can do um, there's nothing more like build a relationship with you. It's like you have my last name, you have my blood, therefore you're my daughter, and that's it. And I always wanted to just have this relationship with my dad. And um, I kept putting my hope, and I kept thinking like it's going to be great, but he kept failing through. And so over time, I felt so sad because I, I just felt helpless at the time. And two, faith-wise, I had no idea. I was actually very skeptical of the Bible. And I was in between, should I be Muslim or should I be Christian? And it was hard because my mom's side of the family were like, if you become Muslim, you're going to go to hell. And then on my Muslim side of the family, my dad was like, if you believe in Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And I was like, what in the world? What do I do? And you would think I would go and get help? No. I decided to run to the world. And drinking became my life at the time. Taking different substance became my life. You know, going to, to uh, different parties. There have been, I remember, three times where I completely uh, passed out and had to go to the hospital. You know, and so I was at a place where I'm like, man, like, what do I do? I'm just 17 years old. And I'm, I was already thinking about taking away my life because I saw it absolutely hopeless. And, um, but I'm grateful because I wasn't at the time really eagerly seeking for God, but God was seeking after me. And uh, uh, Sylvie actually, is Sylvie here? Is she still on her way? Where's Sylvie? Oh, there's Sylvie! Sylvie shared her faith with me. Sylvie, I'm so grateful for you. I really am. I'm, I'm so grateful for you because I remember I was in the cafeteria and I had this big old hoodie. I want nobody to talk to me. <laughs> and then she just came up and invited me to a Bible discussion and I was very hesitant. Um, but I remember they just encouraged me to, to challenge the idea of God. And it was incredible to be able to just get into God's word and see the promises. And I was like, wow, I didn't know I was loved. I didn't know I was cherished. I didn't know about these promises. I had no idea. And like it says in the scriptures, I was like, wow, I can finally see. And so I decided to be a Christian back in 2017. And one of the best decisions of my life. Um, and, but when I decided to become uh, a Christian, I had to tell my Muslim family. 
Man, it was tough, guys. It was tough um, because I knew my cost was that when I said Jesus is Lord, I was about to lose my family. And uh, my dad said, if you get into those waters, I'm going to disown you from the family. And so I had to pray and fast. Um, but I was like, I, I already, I know the truth. I can't turn away. And so I became a Christian, and I got disowned from the family. And I haven't seen my dad for over six years now. You know? And you know what, guys? I say it. Not, this is not supposed to be a morbid story. Like, I, I love my dad. I've forgiven him. I, I love him. Um, but the thing is, is about this lesson is that my joy is not determined by my circumstances. You know, I could rejoice because in uh, Proverbs 68, verse 6, it says he sets the lonely in families. And I got an incredible big family and many father figures. I can rejoice because in Romans 8, 15, it says God is my true Abba right? In Proverbs um, 139, verse 17 to 18, it says that God is always emotionally available for me. Praise God. And he's always listening. And I'm so grateful that even in my lowest moment as a Christian, I know that he will never turn his back on me. And therefore, ladies, I rejoice. And I'm so grateful. And so there's been many times where Satan tries to get in there. You know, in John 10.10, 10, it states uh, that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And so I want to ask you, ladies, how has your joy been taken away? Right? There's been many ways in how Satan can take us out. And so some of the things that our joy can be taken away, there's a couple of things. The first thing is unresolved conflict, right? Maybe there's a sister who has hurt you, but you haven't gotten open about it, you know? Maybe you're allowing this hurt to fluster in you, and so you end up being critical towards her, right? Or even bitter. The second thing is his uh, comparison or being envious. Oof. In Proverbs, it says that envy rots the bones, you know, so we, I think in the kingdom, I, I think we can be tempted to compare each other to the sisters, but I think the most dangerous thing to our joy is to compare, uh, comparing ourselves to the people in the world, right? You start seeing your friends get married in the world. You start seeing them have kids, get great jobs. I remember as a college student, I was failing, and um I was seeing all my friends just like graduate and I was like, look at them. But then I was, I started blaming God. I started blaming uh, um, my faith for where I was at. But we can't compare ourselves because it takes our joy away. Um, the third thing is complaining. That's a big one. And we may not like outwardly complain, but I know for me, I can inwardly grumble, right? Like, oh. Just another Bible study, I was about to go home. Dang it. Instead of thinking like, no, there's an open woman who wants to be saved. Right? We can grumble. We can complain. The fourth thing is pride. Ladies, if you haven't read the book, I believe it's called Prideful. You already know it. And if you already read it, read it again, because I am currently reading it. But pride can get in the way. You know, we start relying on, on our own strength. We stop having our quiet times because we think we can do everything on our own. And then we end up burnt out. And we just don't want to give because we didn't have our quiet time. That's the, that's the time where God wants to strengthen you, right? I think another way where our pride can come out is during our D times, our mentoring times. When uh, someone goes there with truth and love and tells you what you got to work on, but you don't have the humility to go after it. And so it stops you, and you can't be joyful. I think another one, number five, is anxiety. This, is, this one's a big one. And a lot of the anxiety that I'm talking about here that it stems from fear, maybe a lack of trust in God, or being surrendered or content, or not being content in where you're at in life. I think for me, the number six is shame. Shame and being regretful. I think I can think a lot in the past and I can dwell on it. And it's very hard for me to move forward because I'm still dwelling on something that happened in the past. And lastly, for us women, I think idolatry can be a big one. Yeah. 
that can easily take our joy away because God is supposed to be the source of our joy. But then we slowly start replacing other things like relationships, your boyfriend, your husband, friendships, maybe your kids, your job, or some ideal dream that you want, but God hasn't given you. And so idolatry can be a big one. And so the challenge here, it reminds me of the, the scripture in Psalms 51, where David says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And what I love about this Psalms is that this is right after he uh, murders someone and he's adulterous. These are some heavy sins, right? And he doesn't go to God that, and he says, like, restore my salvation. No, 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 no. He says, restore the joy of your salvation. And so I realized when we actually give into sin because that happens, it doesn't automatically take our salvation away. But when we give into these certain things, it takes our joy away, right? And I don't know if you notice in the list, again, it doesn't mention any hardships or circumstances that can take your joy away. Because in James, it talks about, like consider every trial pure joy and so when things happen you have two choices you could either be righteous or don't be righteous <laughs> you can either have godly pers uh, perspective or not have godly perspective right so you gotta choose what you want to do and so how do we do this how do we, uh, we restore uh, that joy and the practical is is just by remembering Right? Read Deuteronomy. It's an incredible book. But he's always reminding the, Egyptian, uh, the Egyptians, the Israelites, to remember your Egypt. Remember what I saved you from. And so I know a couple of Sundays ago, uh, Jason actually challenged us to get, uh, get with someone that we don't really know and just share our lives, share our conversion story. And I wish she was here. She had a dentist appointment, so she's so, uh, uh, sore. But Alicia, she actually um, hit me up last week because she wanted to share her story. And so we met up at a Starbucks, and she shared her life, and it was incredible. It was so faith-building, you know, just to hear her story. And it just, it gave me, when you hear her story, it gave me no excuse in my relationship with God, right? But pick someone. Share your life. Remember what God has redeemed you from. Please, ladies, that's how you're going to restore your joy and remind you the joy of your salvation. So now, turn with me to Acts 2. Acts 2, verse 22. What we're about to uh, stumble across is an incredible moment in biblical history. God wanted to give something very special to those who would be his people and his very own. You know, his chosen people, his special possessions, God's family here on earth. And that, that those who eventually will be in heaven with him, which is the establishment of the kingdom of God. And so my second point is the joy of the kingdom. And so we're going to start reading at verse 42, I believe, yeah, chapter 2, verse 42. Uh -uh, uh -uh. Context-wise, actually, before we actually read it, um, is what's incredible here is that when Peter was preaching about the word of God, right after 3,000 were baptized. And so we're going to see what happened to those 3,000. What was their attitude? What was their lifestyle? What was their beginning of their lives? Because remind you, sisters, this is the church that we say we're striving to be and that we're going to imitate. And so I know a lot of us read this before many, many times, but we're going to read it again because I think we need to be reminded. So in verse 42, it says the fellowship of the believers. Verse 42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily to those who are being saved. 
I love this scripture. It is so amazing because out of pure gratitude for their salvation, it says that they devoted themselves. Now, if you don't know what the word devoted means, it means to give all or a large part of one's time and resources, right? And so back in this scripture, it says that they gave everything they had to the teachings. What were they teaching? It says that they gave all to the relationships there. You know, remind you, these people, a lot of them, they didn't know each other, right? And so, but they gave everything they had. And also, they gave all to the breaking of bread, which means they had time to uh, reflect on the cross and get open with one another. And this is the kingdom, the blueprint that God has shown us what he's established here on earth. And it's like, it's like uh, you know, a lot of us, we were there last Women's Day, right? And it's like that every single day, but you don't get tired of it, you know? And there's a lot more food at uh, Women's Day. <laughs> a lot more food. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but it's like that every day. Um, and it, they, they value the kingdom. And they showed that. Remember, joy means to express God's goodness. And they showed that with one another. And I think I really want to take this time to lift up all the mamas. Because you guys, you guys value the kingdom. Like Tanya, who has three little ones. And Sarah, we have Lindsay, Charlotte with little baby Chloe. I love little baby Chloe. Ashley, Tramala. Oh my gosh, Tramala, you're incredible. Uh, Deshay, Vicky. I'm sorry if I'm missing anybody else, but um, but man, guys, these these mamas are so convicting. They all have full time jobs. They all have to take care of the little ones. You know, maybe I'm pretty sure there's a lot more in between, but they still take the time in their schedule. I'm pretty sure they're even tired. They deny themselves and they come here to midweek, right? They come to to Sunday service and whatever they have to go, and they just serve and they just give. Like I was so grateful a couple of weeks ago. Tanya was like, let me just take you out. And I was like, thank you. And I didn't know anybody. And we went up, uh, some candle making and whatnot. It was, was super fun. I'm so grateful for you, Tanya. Um, but man, I, something that um, I always get convicted because uh, when college students, when they tell me that they're super busy, I always say like, uh, are you married and do you have kids? And they're like, no, then you ain't busy. <laughs> You're not busy. And I tell myself all the time where I'm like, man, I feel so overwhelmed. And then I start thinking about Lindsay. I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I got this. I could do this. I ain't got kids yet. Yet. Ah! <laughs> Amen. But I just want to again lift up the mamas. I'm really grateful for, you, uh, for your sacrifice and coming out here and serving. Um, I love you guys. But... Back into this blueprint that God had, the first thing I want to look at is that they devoted to the apostles' teachings, right? And one thing about family, we take care of each other, not just physically, but spiritually. And I really want to challenge us and ensure that we're having consistent mentoring times, guys. We shouldn't be having D times once a month, twice a month, right? Uh, we need to figure out a time where we can have mentoring times weekly so that we can check on one another, right? Those who are discipling, like, if you can't figure out where your women are at spiritually, that that's a problem. you got to figure out and get in there. Um, but those on the receiving end of the discipling, does your discipler have to chase you? You know, like, does she be like, so when are you available? When are you available? When are you available? And you don't respond back. You know, we, it says again, the people, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. And like it says in Second Peter 1, it says God has given us everything everything we need to live a godly life. And so we have no excuse to get into God's word. So go after your discipler. Maybe they need help. Go ask. You know, get some help. Um, but we need to take, uh, take care of each other in this way and have a deep conviction in our D times. And the second thing I really want to focus on is devote it to the fellowship. Right? It says again, every day, uh, every day they continued to meet together. They loved being around each other. And I believe they wanted to be there. 
they wanted to get to know each other, right? And I think um, they enjoyed doing it because they were grateful. But I think I can see some of us, um, we want others to, to uh, give their hearts to us. We want others to be family with us. But we're unwilling to give our hearts. We're unwilling to be family for others, right? If you see a lack of family, if you see a lack of anything, love, serving, don't just stand back and, and just talk about it or complain or get critical. Do something about it because you are the disciples. You are the kingdom. You are the church, right? And so we can build this. You know, another thing too, like when it comes to being devoted in the fellowship, I could see a lot in when it's uh, fellowship breaks and I look I'm like, look, and I'm usually my, my goal is, is like, I got to be intentional. Let me see who I can talk to. But when I walk around, sometimes I can't tell who is the disciple or who is their first time at church. And the reason why is because I'm like, who, your, your joy is not just expressed in like, uh, you know, cheerleading. Guys, like joy is not a, a personality, okay? It's the way how you sing. It's the way how you give. And then I can see some, uh, I, here's the thing, guys. Um, when I say this, I'm not looking down at anybody. I, I say this with deep conviction and passion because out of all people, I've been discipled on this. Like, I've been always told, because what I would do during fellowship break, run to the bathroom. <laughs> I got to do something. I got to get something in the car. <laughs> when I have nothing. <laughs> I would always make an excuse. I got to do so. I got to check on somebody in Kids Kingdom. I'm not even in Kids Kingdom. I don't even have kids. But I'm serious. I would get, I just didn't, I didn't want to give in the fellowship. I didn't, to be honest, in my shame, I, I didn't think it was that important, you know. Uh, and I realized, I, I, and I always in my heart, I'm like, why, why do I not feel like family? It's because I wasn't being family, right? And then I got discipled on <laughs> my resting bitter face. <laughs> okay. Why does everybody keep asking me how am I doing? I'm doing fine. <laughs> and then, like, the more they ask, the more I'm getting angry. <laughs> but anyways, but yeah, or like sometimes in, in the singing, I'm like, you know, again, joy is not a personality. You don't have to be like Lysa. Lysa be singing her heart out. I love it. She's a great example of someone who expresses their joy through singing. It's so convicting. But sometimes when I look back, I'm just, you just see like, she got the joy, 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 joy. <laughs> Guys, you are saved. You have salvation. God loves you. You are in a good place. Sing with all your heart. And here's the thing. If you don't know the song lyrics, just ask. Ask for help. I got a couple of songbooks for some reason in my uh, house. I, I should be passing them out. They're, they're always just getting end up in the house for some reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll give you one after if you need one, if you need to learn the songs. But again, we got to be a kingdom that expresses our joy. You know, we need to value this because we're grateful. We want to help each other get stronger spiritually. And in the end of the day, to help each other get to heaven because that's the ultimate goal, right? Uh, but we need to express this, uh, express this because it's not just about us. It's about helping others enjoy what we have. And I looked up this uh, statistic, or it's like this research group uh, website where they, like, a lot of the statistics, they talk about, like, religious stuff and whatnot. But um, they did this, like, unbiased uh, interviews with people who are not believers um, to get their views on what they think uh, or how they think Christians are. And uh, the top three was judgmental, hypocritical, and out of touch. And none of them say, they, none of them said like happy or joyful, right? And that should be the main quality about us. And it got me mad. I was like, man, that is how the world sees us. And, you know, I had this, uh, this very humbling moment because 
Um, back in San Francisco, I had the opportunity to baptize this incredible gal. Her name is Tadala. And um, when we were having our first mentoring time, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to share my life and all this stuff. And so I can help her be vulnerable. And um, as I was sharing my life, getting open about certain things, I even got open and I was like, yeah, I'm feeling overwhelmed by this, this, and that. And um, and she's so sweet. She, oh, one day you guys are going to be here. She has like this cute uh, British voice, but I'm not going to imitate right now. No. But I was like, so Tadala, like, how are you? And so she's actually, oh. Thanks, Mel. <laughs> Thanks, Chica. It's okay if it... <laughs> okay, but thank you, Mel. Um, but when she got open how she was doing, she's actually from uh, Malawi, Africa. And I had no idea the, the state of Malawi until I met her. And um, she's like, you know what? She's like, I'm really grateful that I can be stressed or overwhelmed by school. Like, that's the only thing that I can be overwhelmed by. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean by that? And uh, she's from Malawi, and it, if you guys look it up, like, man, Malawi is one of the top 10 um, uh, places that are absolutely, like, filled with poverty, right? Everyone there, more than 80% of the population are under $2 a day, right? That's how much money they make. And so her coming here from Malawi, she was like, I'm grateful that the only thing I can stress about is school and nothing else. Because she's like, in my people right now, she went to Walmart and she felt like super overwhelmed. And I was like, what's, are you okay? She's like, how come do you guys have all these choices of cereals? And then she's like, but my people, they can't even find clean water. And it just broke my heart, and it humbled me because there are moments where um, I can, when I'm in the mood or have an attitude, I can show it in my face. And something that uh, my husband does, that when he sees me, this is all he says. He's like, babe, you have a good life. And I'm like, that's right. Like, guys, as disciples, we have a good life. If you really think about it, we, we have it good good I mean even just outside of being disciples just as Americans like man we're so entitled by everything and it's just like we have a good life there's really nothing to complain about there's nothing to be sad about you know there's nothing to get down about we have a good life and you got to see that and so I want to to kill this narrative of being not being joyful and I and I do believe that I wholeheartedly believe that that I'm looking at a a group of women who wants to kill that as well and show the world what it really means to be a true Christian. And so, lastly, my third point is the joy of living out our purpose. And I was looking at some quotes, and one of the quotes here, it says that um, joy is a net of love by which you can catch souls. And I love that. And it's so true. Joy is so contagious. Or contagious? Yeah, contagious. And like, man, when, you're, when you see a joyful person, you're just drawn to it. You just want to be around that. And so we talked about like the uh, having joy in our salvation, having joy in the kingdom. Imagine you're, you're coming out of the waters. And you're like, man, I've been healed. I've been redeemed. I've been saved. God is good, but I'm going to tell nobody. Right? Does that make sense? No. Why would you not share it? Right? And it reminds me here in Luke 19. Actually, let's go there real quick. Luke 19, verse 10. Luke 19, verse 10. What does it say? Mm -mm. Just one simple scripture. And it says in Luke 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. You know, usually this is the part in uh, my lesson where I'll explain the, the scripture, but I don't think I need to explain the scripture. <laughs> 
right? Because this was Jesus' purpose. This, like, man, you can read out the, the, the four Gospels and throughout the, the whole New Testament. This was God's mission, was to seek and see the, uh, seek the laws. And so as disciples who follow Jesus, that needs to be our very purpose as well. We were created to do that, to proclaim his name, right? And something that I was, when I was studying out Jesus, um, there's not many uh, recordings of him having very low moments, maybe like one or two, but not as much. And I realized it's because he was always outwardly focused, right? And I realized that, like, I'm so grateful that God has given us a, a purpose where we don't, when we focus too much on ourselves, man, it could just take us out. But God wants to focus on the sisters in the church and also focus on the lost, right? And so when I think about this, I, I just, I'm so encouraged. I, I think something to also bring up uh, when it comes to purpose, it's not, it's not your, your career. It's not, um, uh, you know, as being a student in the, deg uh, the degree that you want. Although these are obviously great things, keep going after it. But do you guys, guys have to remember that purpose, it, it, um, from what God gives us, is something that never dies out, right? It's, purpose is supposed to be the very thing that wakes you up in the morning. And so if you lose your job or if you don't, you know, get the best of grades at school, etc. There's no need for us to get down because you still have purpose. God still wants to use you. You're still a vessel and everywhere you go. And that's the amazing thing about the purpose that he has given us. And so we got to live that out. And I really want to lift up uh, the women who recently got baptized. Like the first one that I think about is Laura. Oh, guys, if you haven't had got the time to talk to Laura... She has an incredible, incredible story. Uh, she, <laughs> she just has, I don't have time to tell the whole story, but she's incredible. But right after the water, she was like, I need to get all my friends. Um, and it was incredible, too. This past uh, Women's Day, she actually got her aunt from Bakersfield to come drive down to Women's Day. You know, already being so contagious. I love it. Um, but also, Rochelle, it's actually so funny. Regine um, lift her up, but it's so true. There was this moment um, where there's like this uh, cafeteria on campus, and the very next day, she went from table to table, sharing with everyone. And that cafeteria for sure has more than 100 people, tops. Like, it's incredible. But she went and just shared her faith with each of the tables. This love you, Michelle. Also, too, uh, she actually, I remember... She, uh, she was studying with someone, um, and uh, she's like, you should come share our faith. And so she took the girl that was studying the Bible to uh, share her faith with Rochelle, and she was so inspired, you know. So I want to lift up Rochelle, but also Erica. <sighs> Erica's incredible. She now, uh, her, I believe her, her aunt, who also came to Women's Day, was very impactful and wants to study the Bible. And Jenna. <laughs> Jenna, I love you, Jenna. She's incredible. I love her. I just love all these women. Um, but, man, she's been forcefully advancing her friends and bringing out her mom to, to everything. And I, I believe her mom is open in studying the Bible as well. And so these are just women who are living out their purpose, right? And they're just so outwardly focused. And I'm so grateful for them. But it's it's. it's like God created this plan to keep us faithful as disciples because when I'm in these studies I, I'm like reminded I'm like wow like this is more important than anything else to save these lost souls and when I think about it like when you're you're out and you're like um baptizing people like you're not you're not thinking like oh I gotta pay that bill or like oh man I gotta do this I gotta do laundry when I get home no you're thinking like she made it she made it into the waters all those like early oh my gosh I remember who was it I don't even remember we were studying with someone like 5 a.m 7 a.m every day <laughs> oh yeah Helen amen ah oh, amen just leave it just leave it it's fine. Uh, but it was like, it was worth it. It was worth losing the sleep. Because in the end of the day, I'm not going to take anything with me but the souls that I reaped. So praise God. 
You know, so live out your purpose, ladies. This is what you're meant to do. And I just want to encourage you guys, like, I know that, uh, you know, God God wants to answer our prayers. Like, pray and, and fast and being fr- personally fruitful with one girl this year. One girl. It's barely what? Barely in March? Pray and fast. Think about anyone in your workplace. Maybe anyone in your family. It's the year of miracles. Pray and fast for that one person and they will get baptized. Um, but also, I think for the campus, um, I think when it comes to sharing our faith, faith like man like shock people I'd be like hey do you want to come to the best thing ever like you know <laughs> I remember uh one of the sisters uh Talia but I was learning how to share my faith and I was so afraid I was so afraid and uh we go to a group uh um this is people eating right they're about to sit down and about to eat and she's like wait don't sit down, like literally just like that. And I was like, what is she doing? She's like, don't sit down. You don't want to sit there. That's how Talia talks. She's like, you don't want to sit there. Come join us over here to Bible talk. And then as crazy as the sound, they were persuaded and they went. I'm still working on that. Amen. But campus, we definitely got to show our joy on campus, right? We got to, there's so many uh, campus ministries there, but we got to stand out with our joy. And I think for the singles and the marriage, I know it's definitely a a different field because on on campus, there's students everywhere. But something that I want to mention when it came to uh, Jesus, he, he was always healing on the way, right? And so no one's expecting you to share your faith with 20 people, 30 people, but on your way to the bus station, uh, bus station or uh, Tanya brought it up to the soccer games uh, to grocery shopping you can share with one just share with one and you won't regret it even if they say no you're like at least I did it praise God right and so share your faith this is your purpose live it out and it will bring joy in your life anyways I digress but in closing thoughts something I want to mention is that joy is our inheritance God isn't looking down, ladies, and pressuring us to put on a good face for his reputation's sake. Instead, God loves us, and joy is something he desperately wants us to have. For God, joy is not a strict strict standard we must meet, but a generous gift we get to accept. And lastly, joy is our witness. Our joy is not simply for us. It's something we are meant to share and proclaim. So ladies, let us be the redeemed who has joy. Let us take that back and give it to the world. I love you guys.